We are coming back to you live on YouTube. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Welcome back to the Royal Talents Creator Thanks. Studio. Oh, hold on. Second Jeff is trying to jump in there. There we go. There we go. That was the recorded Jeff. All right. I am back. Welcome to the Royal Talents Creator Studio, now live on YouTube. This is our second show on YouTube, so we're still working out some bugs, but I think we got it fixed, and I see some comments coming up there. People are saying hello. Oh, my gosh, Saskatoon. Hello, Saskatoon, Jody. Uh, so awesome to see so many familiar faces, and thank you for making the trip over to YouTube with us. Uh, so we have a fantastic guest today, but before uh, I introduce her, I wanted to, of course, announce, as always, our giveaway. We're going to be giving away a set of Rembrandt oils today, so I'm excited about that, uh, to be eligible to win. Uh, if this is your first time joining the show, all you have to do is make a comment or ask a question today uh, during the live broadcast, and at the end, we'll pick a name and announce that lucky winner, and then we'll get in touch with you, and you will get yourself a set of Rembrandt oils, so an awesome prize. So like I said, we have a phenomenal painter as our guest today. One of the most well-recognized women artists in contemporary Western art today. Her works center on emotion and mood, and you're going to really see that uh, in the examples we have to share today. And they often contain dramatic light and atmospheric effects. She has garnered recognition through many professional organizations, including the Portrait Society of America, the Oil Painters of America, and she's an ARC living master. She has garnered many national and international awards, including the Women Artists of the West National Exhibition Best of Show, the International Artist Magazine People and Figures Grand Prize winner. Some great awards there and recognition. Her works have participated in shows around the world, including the Arc Salon Exhibition at Sotheby's New York and the European Museum of Modern Art in Barcelona, Spain. Join me, everybody, in welcoming our newest Royal Talents Ambassador, Tina Garrett. Tina, how are you doing today? Hey, how are you, Jeff? I'm doing great. Thank you. I'm doing great. I'm going to switch it just to gallery view so everybody can see us both. There we go. Thanks for joining us. This is fantastic to have you on the show. I've been looking forward to it. Thank you. Me too. I'm so proud to be uh, an ambassador. I really am. And I'm excited to get to visit with you more and introduce myself to everyone who already knows and loves Rembrandt Paints. Oh, we're cer certainly honored to have you on the role. And uh, I, you know, I'm going to talk about this a little later. When I was looking at your CV, I recognized a lot of names of our existing ambassadors who you worked with, and I thought that was really cool. So there really is a community uh, and uh, uh, collaboration that happens amongst our ambassadors, and I, and I just love that part of it. Yeah, I think you're kind of in the right, the, the right circles when you are already connected with the people who love the same stuff that you love and are using the same things that you are using, and, and they're they're like your peers. And then I, I already noticed like Kathy Anderson. And yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I'm just really proud to yeah. be included. Thank you. You bet, you bet. And I have a great gig because I get to work with all of you <laughs> and spend time you tolerate with you. us, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and learn learn so much. It's been such a wonderful learning experience, uh, being able to be associated with everyone and then spend time with everyone and learn so much about your work and working process. Uh, and today is just kind of a small taste of that. And I'm glad that we get to share it with everybody. And, and we've got more and more for, folks turning in. So that's fantastic. I do want to uh, mention that please definitely put in the comments questions that you have. We are going to save those toward the end. So I've got a brief interview that I'm going to have uh, with Tina today. And then we have a great slideshow of some examples of her work that we're going to talk about. And then when we finish that, then I'm going to come back to the questions and do my best to gather as many of them as possible and then uh, share those with Tina and we'll, we'll answer them. And then at the end, we'll have some announcements uh, as well as announcing the winner. So uh, just a few quick questions to kind of break the ice. Where are you calling in from today? I am calling in from Lee Summit, Missouri, which is just about 20 minutes south of Kansas City. Casey Mo, I love it. Right, go love Chief. <laughs> oh, fantastic Super Bowl to watch. And, and uh, I love my time there. I spent a short amount of time in Kansas City myself. Great city, great art museums, great community. It is. I actually do workshops here at my studio. And I it's one of my favorite parts about doing that is I get people from all over the world who come here. Uh, sometimes I'll have people uh, also teach here, like Michelle Dunaway's taught here, Romel De La Torre, um, uh, Dennis Perrin. I've just had so many uh, great artists come here, but one of my favorite parts is getting to take everybody to our great museums and some of our our more uh, beautiful spaces and really good restaurants. We've got great food in Kansas City. 
Yeah, great. Well, of course, the barbecue is famous, right? Uh, but, but lots of different choices. Uh, it, it's an amazing place. And now maybe I have a reason to come back again. Maybe we'll have to do an event. Uh, oh, I would love that. <laughs> and, and gather everybody around. That would be super fun. So I got a few questions for you uh, based uh, on some of the information that I looked up and some of the things we've talked about before. Uh, but one of the things that really jumped out at me right away when I was looking on your website at your CV as recent as 2020, you are continuing to learn and train with other folks. And you talk about some of the people uh, that you've studied with. You mentioned Michelle. Uh, why do you think it's important to include learning as part of your professional practice like that? Oh, my gosh. It's 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 um, it's an integral piece of my own personal growth. I I try to take a workshop once a year. Um, I didn't get my 2022 or 2023 workshop in because I had a, a family member with an illness and I've been kind of being a little bit of a caretaker for her, my sister. And uh, my time got spread a little bit thin in the last two years. But before that, it was Daniel Keyes was my last teacher. Um, absolutely need to learn something new all the time because um if you're only ever sort of honing your own skills you don't even know whether or not you're actually as sharp as you think you are at least that's my perspective on it yeah so um i go very respectfully into the classroom of the teacher that i want to learn from and i try to sit quietly in the back and um I do the same thing I kind of express to my students, which is I'm going to go into their closet and I'm going to try on everything they offer for me to try on. <laughs> and if it's itchy and tight and, and doesn't make me feel good, I don't take it home with me. But if it fits well and I know uh, that it's going to um, push me and help me improve in my own uh, path towards mastery, then I am totally going to do it. And I have I don't think there's any um, uh, problem with taking classes for, all, you know, you're art is a living, growing lifestyle. It's like something that evolves. It's not a place you get to that's stagnant once you're there. So to me, you know, there's no option to not learn. Right, right. It's about discovery kind of at, at a core level, isn't it? Yes. Do you still find that you have these aha moments when you're uh -huh. in those situations? Do you have an example of something like that? Oh my gosh. Well, I have read uh, Richard Schmidt's Alla Prima seven times all the way through and I still get aha moments from it. Um, I think my most recent one was when uh, he was teaching us on a painting, a, a DVD that he did of Michelle Dunaway. And it's, I think it's only like a $45 lesson he sends out uh, uh, over the internet. You can download a downloadable video, but um, he painted her mouth three times. Well, we lost just for a second. We're going to give Tina, we had a little bit of an issue with this beforehand, but I'm sure she's there. Okay, we lost you for just oh. a second, Tina. You were Sorry. talking about, yeah, you said Richard had painted her mouth three times and then you froze. So I thought you were giving an example, but. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. no, he painted Michelle's Dunaway's mouth three times. He wiped it out and painted it again three times in the course of that instructional video. I think it was filmed by Scott Burdick and they all chose to leave that in on intentionally because. No, uh oh, we, we lost again. Hopefully we'll get through this. Bear with we us, everybody. Oh, we lost you quickly uh, there again. I'm so sorry. I know we thought we were over this, but somebody's stealing some of our, our stream bandwidth. Our bandwidth? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Don't you just love and hate technology at the same time? I know it. I know it. Well, hopefully we'll get through it and there won't be too many. Too many. Right. Yeah. Well, for me, the lesson of seeing Richard paint um, that mouth again three times was permission. No. <laughs> and then to change it if it's wrong. Yeah, so we, we lost that again. We, we lost you at permission. Oh. <laughs> but we're gonna, we're gonna, let's go ahead and jump ahead and we'll come back to that because I think it's important uh, uh, to share that, that experience. And everybody is chiming in that they have the same kind of feeling about learning. And I certainly do too. It's just like, it never ends. There's, Robert Henry wrote a great book, The Art Spirit. I don't know if you've, you've ever read it. It's really just a collection of notes and experiences. And he uh, uh, 
uh, talks about always being a student and forever learning. And it's really important part uh, of the process for him of being an artist and being part of a community too. Um, so next question before we jump into the slideshow. So you are primarily an oil painter. Uh, what is it about the oil medium that inspires you most and challenges you? Well, I feel comfortable with oil because to me, it's such a forgiving medium. There's lots of ways to repair a painting that you have taken in the wrong direction or have. Peace. Sorry, guys. We're going to hang on. Uh, that was a quick one. So maybe it's getting better. And maybe it's getting. I hope better. so. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've got full bars. If that helps, I hope. <laughs> no, um, oil allows you to correct things as you go. And it also allows you to repair if for heaven forbid you accidentally damage a, a finished painting. Um, my first uh, steps into creating art were in pastel, Rembrandt pastels, in fact, but they were, um, the medium is so much more delicate and the finished product can be ruined by moisture or water or even a strong wind. And that was really difficult for me. Um, I wanted to work in something I knew that was um, tougher and that could take my um, my need to kind of um, go through the process more physically and change things as I go and develop things as I go and not um, and not uh, be like fragile as as pastels can be. Yeah, you made you, you say something that I've heard again and again from professional artists about oil paint being forgiving. I think there's a perception out there that oil painting is somehow just for advanced artists. Uh, but I have found things like watercolor, especially, uh, are much more challenging and unforgiving, uh, even though the familiarity with the medium is so common. Uh, oil painting really does give you a lot of opportunity to go back in, to continue to work on it, to scrape things out if you're totally frustrated. There's just lots of options. So I'm glad that you mentioned that about oils. It's really accessible for anybody who wants to put in the time to, to learn it. Yes. And there are lots of different approaches there. There's not just one way to paint in oils. And each of yeah. those different methods offer different levels of workability and um, uh, moldability and process. So uh, it, it, it's, it's just, it's almost like frag, just like fractures of beautiful light. Like you can just look at all the different ways, yeah. like looking at a diamond. Oil painting just lets you see all these different ways that the light can go through. And I love that part of it. Yeah, yeah, the tonal quality of oil paint is really unmatched uh, with other mediums, absolutely. And we can thank uh, Van Eyck for all these wonderful ways to manipulate the paint, uh, you know, whether we're adding mediums or, or uh, resins or whatnot, secatives to it to change the working properties. There's lots of ways to affect that to whatever your particular desire or technique is for sure. Yes, including your substrate. I know you sent yeah. me some papers yeah. and it just is such a different material than say uh, a linen that has a yeah. uh, gesso prime versus say a, a canvas that has a triple lead prime. I mean, even in just changing your substrate, you change your workability and your process. Yeah, yeah. things like texture, absorbency, all those kind of things have, have an effect on what you get for sure. Um, one last question before we look at the, the paintings and that is uh, Western art. Uh, I'm a big fan of Western art. As a matter of fact, it was my best friend's parents were collectors of Western art. And every year we would go to a Western art show. This was in Spokane, Washington, growing up. And that was the first time I thought about being an artist as a career. So it was really inspired me. In some ways, I still think of myself as a Western artist. Um, but I wanted to get your definition of contemporary Western art uh, and how your work specifically re relates to this genre. Well, for me, Western art started in childhood. My dad was from Fort Worth, and um, to me, he was my hero. And so much of the pieces that I paint today in the Western art theme are kind of my wink to him. He passed when I was only 24. And so I uh, keep him in my life by going back through all of these memories. And I once found a... Um, an old sketchbook that unfortunately ended up getting water damage. I live in a 1920s home and it had been stored in an unsafe place. Mm. But I went through it and I found all these old sketches of cowboys leaning against fence posts and Indians riding horses. And I thought, my God, I'm still doing the same stuff <laughs> I when I was a little girl. And uh, one of my favorite childhood memories is sneaking up at night and waiting behind my uh, dad's recliner and watching old Westerns. He, would pretend that he didn't know I was there. 
so that I wouldn't get in trouble for being out of bed. And it was kind of our little time together. Like, and at some point he'd be like, okay, you've had enough. Now really go to bed. So <laughs> That's great that you had that opportunity. Uh, my father took up painting later in life. Uh, and he's an old cowboy. And most of his subject matter, of course, when he started painting and sculpting were, was Western art. Uh, wow. But it was really wonderful that, you know, kind of brought us together and had a subject we could talk uh, to each other about. And and he had tons of questions, uh, of course, for me about materials and techniques and things. So it was kind of fun to kind of see our roles reverse later in life. That would be amazing. I would love for somehow for my dad to see what I was able to do yeah. with what I always did as a kid. But um, in terms of myself and the work that I make, it's it's so personally um, focused. It's my internal compass drives what I paint. And I think the contemporary Western art label is a, a, something that's been kind of bestowed upon me. Uh, and I am so honored by it. But um, and I look at all of what people are painting today is kind of like whatever their voice is. And if you are thinking externally about like, I want to be this kind of painter, I want to be that kind of painter. I'm not, for me, that wouldn't really feel authentic. So I definitely um, paint whatever it is I feel like painting subject matter wise. And uh, a lot of times that that's are those winks to my dad, but sometimes it's a ballerina and sometimes it's a boat on the water. <laughs> I mean, it could be all over the place. Um but the one thing that kind of ties my work together in like a little patchwork quilt is just the fact that it's it's what I really want to say. Whatever the subject matter is, it is always authentically what I actually want to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and to be considered in that circle of what would be call a contemporary Western painter is just a huge privilege and an honor. It's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. And we've got some examples. So uh, okay. I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, and then we can continue talking about it while we're looking at some of the images. I'm fascinated by it. So I'm going to share my screen. So everybody give us a second as we flip over. You're going to see this presentation come up. All right. Can you see that okay, Tina? I can. All right. Well, we'll start here. This is my piece, Ambrosia Gold, and I utterly loved painting her. I was fortunate enough to have... Um, a really good friend that has a gallery in Scottsdale. And I had pieces uh, at the Museum of Western Art in Kerrville, Texas. And one of them was really large. And I was teaching in Fort Worth. And then I went down to Kerrville and picked up this painting uh, from the round, uh, Roundup show down there and drove it on to Scottsdale with me, where I taught a workshop at the Scottsdale Artist School. And the painting was so big, I couldn't get it out of my car. It wasn't this painting. It was a, a painting of flamenco dancers and uh, musicians playing on stage, kind of inspired by uh, Sergeant's Ahaleo. Yeah, yeah. And um, I just out of the blue called my friend who has the gallery out there on Main Street, Scottsdale, and said, Cindy, do you think that I could store this painting in your gallery for the 45 days I'm here in town because I just realized I can't get it up the stairs in my condo <laughs> and I'm terrified to leave it in my car for this. I mean, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? And she said, absolutely. Without sight unseen, she said, bring it and she'll put it in her space, which is just a small private gallery that sells her own work. Right. And it was such a generous thing. And I said, well, here's what's going to happen. If it sells, we split it 50, 50 as if I'm you know, represented by right, you. Right. And if it doesn't sell, I'll get it out of your hair when I drive back to Kansas City um, in a, about a month and a half. And so it, it sold in the first week. <laughs> and I was having such a great time being in her gallery. She never had anybody to like help her watch it so she could have an afternoon off or anything. So I set up an easel and started painting this piece. It sold before it was finished. That's fantastic. And it was just so much fun to be in that, uh, I'm not really ever in that gallery space where I'm sort of performing in front of people or, you know, I teaching is a different thing, but in front sure. of just people who enjoy art, who want to come pass through, you know, it's actually always kind of scared me a little bit to do that because you always wonder if they're going to walk into your space and go, oh, I could do that. or <laughs> You don't know. 
Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but this one just rolled off my uh, easel. It was, um, I think, four or five days of work, a few hours each day. And I built it piece by piece uh, with using um, transparent oxide red with just a little bit of viridian in it and uh, to kind of just take that heat off. And yeah. I used a double lead primed cotton duck, uh, which is one of my um, favorite uh rolls you buy it by the big long roll yeah. and she's i think uh gosh i'm trying to remember how i think she might be 50 by 48 she's pretty big pretty good size canvas yes. yeah. and it was working on in the gallery <laughs> oh god it was fabulous well she, cindy paints big things and she basically let me put my painting on her easel whenever she was not in the gallery and i could keep the you know doors open for her so she could actually go see her husband <laughs> you know, actually get out and do stuff. So for yeah. the years that she's run her own space, her days off have been pretty limited. So I felt like I was kind of paying her back a little bit by watching the space. And um, I really enjoyed painting this. And, and I it made me think, boy, I should probably start painting in front of people. Yeah. <laughs> like for my regular work, not just teaching, but it I is love a great it. way to start a dialogue uh, with folks and it does bring the process to life so, you know, for so many people they only see finished paintings and everything else is a mystery so to see it in creation like that really is a is a treat yes yes and and, and this is one of the pieces where and i i don't always tell everybody this but i guess i'm telling a lot of people now but i actually hide a lot of easter eggs in my paintings and there are several little hidden things in this and i i always love that kind of um it, it's sort of a, a throwback to what I used to do as an illustrator. Oh. I used to do a preschool through uh, 12th grade curriculum for the Nazarene uh, Publishing House, which supplied uh, work for 5,000 churches around the globe. And I was one of their very few artists that worked as a freelancer. And I would make these uh, hidden picture in a pictures and mazes and, you know, uh, find uh, where's Waldo type stuff. Uh, and that was that was. Um, something I carried on with me in my paintings. I really love telling untold stories in the little hidden places of a painting. Well, that's super cool. People are taking screenshots as we speak. So nice. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how it looks. One of the things, I mean, there's lots of wonderful things to say about this painting and all your paintings. One of the things that, that strikes me though, is you always kind of capture this unique perspective with the figure. Um, you know, it very, it's kind of it's very dramatic and theatrical. But uh, what? How did you discover that, or was that something that just evolved? It's been in my work always. Even those little kid drawings were that way. I've I've kind of um, my mom would call it rose colored glasses. Uh, other people might say I'm a romantic. Um, but it's funny that you say theatrical because my my children are both in theater and my son is professionally in in the theater in new york and um i pushed them into that as preschoolers they were in vaudeville and melodrama and all that stuff because i always wanted to do that but as a military child always on the move with three yeah. siblings that kind of extra stuff wasn't something that we could do but my parents could do crayons and you know yeah uh, markers and paper and stuff like that and so um but yeah i i <laughs> theatrical is exactly the way i would describe myself yeah yeah it's kind of they're, they're kind of dreamscapes almost in the sense you're kind of you, the the view is this uh kind of hovering uh view of the subject that wouldn't be i need you to write for me Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> write my marketing for me because i tell you my my ideas on these things I, they just come to me so literally from within yeah. and sometimes actually in dreams. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you were to ask me why you paint it, it's, I would say, because I have to. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you block off, like right in the middle of the painting and look at the lower half and the upper half, the upper half looks kind of, you know, very grounded in the figure in the landscape but when you look at just the bottom half that's where the it, it almost is, is like it starts to float and the, the two together create this uh, uh it's not a conflict it's kind of a marriage of, of these these uh visual experiences that that uh, makes you take notice it's really fun Oh, thank you. I do love this one. And I love that I know the buyer so that if I ever, and it's one of the things that I really do enjoy is being able to go back and see the paintings again to know. That that on? Yeah, I love that too. Yeah. That's great. Oh, and here you are in class, it looks like. 
Yes, I teach all over the world. This actually happens to be in the Netherlands uh, at the Dutch Atelier of Realist Art, which I highly recommend. I had such an incredible um, week there with those students last uh, fall. I also teach in Italy, Portugal. I'll have a workshop in France and South Africa next year. And I am just came back from Australia, plus whatever I do across the United States um, at the Village Arts of Putney, where Richard and Nancy and all the Putney painters uh, paint there at the barn and uh, at, the, of course, the Scottsdale Artist School. I mean, it's, I think at my height, I taught 25 workshops in one year. Wow. I'm more to the 11 to 15 realm yeah. now. Uh, yeah. And trying to slow the train down as I get older, but it's hard. <laughs> that is a lot. 25 workshops is a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to say no when they are telling you, hey, we've got 12 people. Yeah. Just yeah. All you have to every do other week. Up. Right. And, and sometimes back to back, you know, I might be on the road for 40 right. or days, but um, it's taken me some beautiful places. I mean, I have just seen the world and I never would have guessed that that's what I would have been able to do when I first started to paint. It's one of the privileges of our job, isn't it? That, that we were talking about this before the show, traveling and meeting people and seeing places that we would have never otherwise been to. It's it's really a, a privilege, like you said. So true. Now, this is totally random. I'm looking at this photograph and I'm realizing this woman in the bottom right-hand corner. Do you happen to know her name? I could find her name. Uh, there were 14 or 16 students in that workshop. <laughs> I only I bring this up. Yeah, I only bring it up because the last time I was in Amsterdam was with Michelle. And it's we went awesome. to dinner. We went to dinner with uh, um, at the home of a student of hers. And I swear this is, this is the same person. Yes, I bet it is. She she tried very hard to get me to commit to staying at her home the next time I came into town. So oh, I'm yeah. I'm certain that that is probably. I who bet it is. is. Her name's yeah. escaping me right now. Her name's I, escaping I mean, me too. I begged everyone to please put your name tags back on. I'm a I'm a conscientious person, but remembering 16 people's names after only one day is so much. It's fun. tough. Yeah, yeah. it's tough. Well, that's fun. What a, what a fun. Uh, it's a small world. It is a small world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are really an interconnected profession. Yes, it is. It is a small group, um, but a great group. Uh, and the art materials industry, which I'm part of, is also a smaller community and a great group of people. Yeah. I am so glad you chose to show these two and these two together because they are, in fact, two separate paintings. So um, the one on the right uh, is Dream a Little Dream of Me. And this is a a portrait of my daughter. And um, I painted an underpainting nearly identical to it as the one on the left. But um, I struggled so much. Um, the first one I painted was the one on the left, and it's still there. I never painted color over it and uh, ended up painting a second monochrome underpainting so that I could put color on it because I couldn't bear to put color on the first one. And that's one of the big warnings you'll find in Richard's book, Alla Prima, is that uh, don't make your underpaintings so detailed that you can't bear to paint over them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we lost you. It was meant to be. Oh, there you go. You can't, we, we lost you just for a second. Oh, where would, where did I leave off at? <laughs> Um, you were. It was right after you made the comment about Richard. Yes, uh, basically, I find that if that's where it's meant to go, like if if this was meant to be its own piece, then that's where I'll leave it. So uh, I don't mind painting a second one. I actually think the second one turned out better. Um, so, but I do love that I I have. Nope, oh, we lost her again. As soon as we get her back, I'm going to ask her, there's some changes. And I'm sure you guys are comparing and contrasting what's the same, what's different, the way she's holding the flower, are there changes in the drapery, the position of the ottoman, lots of interesting things that uh, decided to make changes to. There we go. Oh, there you're back. Back. Sorry about that, Jeff. I think okay. when I put my hands up, it interferes. I'm going to keep my hands down. That's my, <laughs> I don't know. That's my guess. <laughs> we'll go with it. We'll go with it. Well, while you were gone, I was challenging people to to find the things that were similar and dissimilar between the two. And we were looking at the ottoman, 
uh, changes in the drapery, the position in the flower, some small things, but it's interesting how you made changes. More relaxed on the left, uh, but her posture is a little more uh, relaxed, I think, in the right, especially in the neck. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and I didn't plan those. I, I basically just set aside the first underpainting and began again to make a new one. And uh, they're both identical size. I think it's a 50 by 38. Um, and the color one is available at my gallery uh, on the East Coast called Highlands Art Gallery in Lambertville, New Jersey. So I'm, um, I'm super proud of both of these pieces, but this really does illustrate for me a lot about my process mm. and how that I think about painting in general, how, um, how sort of much leeway I give myself. I'm very um, inner focus driven and not necessarily um, outward deadline. I must paint what sells driven. So um, taking the time it took for me to make the decision to even not put color on this and to make a second painting was totally what needed to happen because yeah. I, I have to paint what it is I need to paint. So um, I love them both. I actually spent about two weeks, if they ever do a DNA swab on this painting on the right, <laughs> I <laughs> spent about two weeks just rubbing it and kissing it goodbye and, and saying my goodbyes. And I even wrote on the back, if you do ever decide to sell this painting, contact me. I want might want to buy it back. And then I instantly laughed out loud. That the <laughs> best way for me to not get rid of this painting is to just not sell it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I never said I was logical. I'm very <laughs> emotional. <laughs> I, yeah, I think all painters are, are that way to a degree. I feel that way. Sometimes you have... Well, actually... My wife is more so. She will come downstairs and she will claim ownership <laughs> over painting. Say, nope, this one's staying. This one's not going. Well, that's the opposite of my husband. He comes down and says, we can't afford to keep that. So sell it. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Funny. It's out the door. <laughs> that is great. I love it. And she's the same way. Does he ever come down and like she will come down and, and say, oh, don't change that, which inevitably I change. It's like she she should know better by now. But uh, does he ever have that? Do you ever have that conversation with him? Yes, I do. I've been married almost 30 years and my husband and I are high school sweethearts. So he knows me as good as any other person on this planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, he knows exactly what to say. I call him my hype girl. Because he he knows exactly what to say to make me feel like I'm doing everything right and it's all going to be okay. And that's, <laughs> I love that. Which is so opposite. My children, my son, is a lot like my husband. He'll come in and say, oh, mom, it's amazing. I love you. You're so talented. And my daughter will come and go, hmm, there's something <laughs> wrong with that eye. <laughs> She's just like me. <laughs> that is great. That is classic. Love it. Well, see, the sons are always loyal to moms. They're they're never. Yes, it's those boys. They love their moms. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this is really dramatic. Yeah. Thank you. This is the one that won the International Artist Magazine. Um... Oh, lost you for just a second. Yeah, I can't wait to hear the story. Someone oh. who lives in the Netherlands. Yeah, it we was just lost you for just a second. Yeah. It wasn't my first international sale, but it was my first sale to someone who lived over in the Netherlands. Mm. Uh, and that was before I even knew that that's where Rembrandt paints were made. So <laughs> I never have considered myself to be, um, you know, um, I don't have a proper art degree. I don't, you know, I'm not um, a, a No, we lost Tina just for a second. She'll be right back with us. I'm just loving how the light is catching that hydrangea behind the figure there. And they just kind of pull that whole background out. And all the wonderful color in the shawl there is fun to... There you are. Oh, we got you back. Sorry. Oh, I hate this. I hope it's not on my end. I feel terrible about it. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. We will get through it. We're doing fine. We're okay. Doing fine. Well, this one is the People and Figures, International Pe uh, Artist Magazine, People and Figures Grand Prize winner. Um, and I am so incredibly proud of this painting. 
Homer. It's like coming in spurts. You're not supposed to be waving your hands around, Tina. <laughs> On the green shoes. It is the more you look at it, it looks really simple at first, but the more you look at it and look in the detail, there are all sorts of wonderful pieces uh, that are just waiting to be discovered in this painting. And there seems to be like a lot of black because the photograph really doesn't um, show that, but it's that Rembrandt transparency that I can get. There's so many beautiful ways to work transparently in Rembrandt paints. Yes, yes. And it's almost impossible to capture that with a photograph. Oh. Did I get back again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We lost you again there for a second. No, there's just so much detail in the darks because of that ability for Rembrandt paints to be semi-transparent or fully transparent. Yeah, there's a the earth colors are a whole series of transparent earth tones. I mean, you mentioned the transparent oxide red, but there's a yellow, an orange, a brown, uh, and then a whole a variety of transparent uh, colors available in the line, as well as opaque colors too. It really gives you uh, a lot of choices. Oh, this is a fun picture. I'll wait till you get back online here. Tell us about this. I'm guessing that's Tina's yes. painting. Is that your painting behind you guys? That is my painting behind me. I was so honored to be invited by Westwind Fine Arts to be a part of this retrospective show with Richard Schmidt's work, Nancy Guzik's work, my work, and I'm forgive me, I'm going to lose the name of the other artist that was there, uh, someone who had long time taken lessons with Richard. Oh, shoots. Shoots, thank you everybody for your patience as we're having some of these technical difficulties. With Richard's work was something I didn't, showing with Richard's work was something I didn't think I would ever accomplish. So it was really a point of pride. Yes, no, that's a great honor. He has such a wonderful legacy. Yes, yeah. And he left us everything he knows in his books and DVDs. So um, I would love to be able to touch base on why I loved his allowing us to see him correct. No, nope, we lost Tina again there. But the, yeah, the Alla Prima books, if you haven't read one, if you don't own one, uh, I recommend strongly uh, going out and getting one, even if you're not a figurative painter per se, uh, there's wonderful landscapes in the books, but just his approach to painting and his teaching method are, are wonderful. And uh, Tina is one example of the wonderful legacy that he's left of, of incredible artists painting all over North America and beyond. So true. That's so true. All right, let's go ahead and... Go through. This is fantastic. Tell us about this painting. Well, you can give her a second here to get through. Yeah, I was struck again by the perspective. We were talking about that early on. Uh, and then just the, the great contrast of the figure in the light sky. And then down below, how it softens. It just really draws you up thank you if anyone is familiar with um nc wyeth this is mm. this these are a lot of my work is in yeah yeah i we lost tina again there but i didn't she, think about that yeah as soon as you said why i see see that that is a great element yeah. such a wonderful painter Yes, and I will I will go so far as to have uh, three or four Wyeth paintings near me while I'm working on my own artwork. Um, and my reference images or my model will be put away and I'll finish the painting with my the work that I love by them. I'm, I'm wondering while we're waiting for Tina to jump back in, what uh, little egg Easter egg are hidden inside of this uh, 
painting. It seems like oh, I, I never tell. You have to find them. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure if you could hear me or not. <laughs> but it's like, ah, oh, there's got to be something here. Uh, this is great. It's such a wonderful painting. I love the Wyeth. All uh, Jamie Wyeth is a big. Uh, I'm a big fan of his work too, especially his portraits, uh, the ones in pastels and charcoals and inks of Andy Warhol and Nureyev and all those. But a great, great family, American history, American art history there. Well, we've definitely got to wait for Tina to talk about this one. This one's wonderful. Yeah, this is called Mystic. It's 58 inches tall. Um, I can't remember how wide she is. Maybe maybe 30. Oh, this one. This is Melancholy. Yes. This is uh, 78 inches wide. Uh, I forget how tall she is. Um, I'm bad with numbers, but um, she was awarded an art No, here's, again, sorry everybody for the technical Check difficulties. Box. There we go. Yeah. Did I did you get that part about No, we didn't. We didn't. Oh. You just said you said it was awarded and then we lost you. Yeah, she was awarded an uh, Art Renewal Center purchase award and uh was put into their collection and then later sold at auction with Bougaro's work uh, mm. at these. So it was a I mean talk about checking off 2023 checked off oh. some Really incredible. I bet that was fascinating to see these paintings side by side. Your work's a lot looser in the background than his, though, isn't it? Oh. Oh, yes. Yeah. But I can see the dialogue. It must have been a wonderful juxtaposition back and forth. You know, um, and there are so many things hidden in the darkness underneath uh, that log and uh, in the sort of the weeds uh mm -hmm. it's one of my yeah this one when you if you could see this one in person that's really yeah i bet and it well and we're just seeing it at such a small scale too the seeing it in person i'm sure it's very immersive little chipmunk down there too Oh, are you back? Yes. Yeah. There we go. I was, I was waxing on about how I use the power of Rembrandt's transparent paints to. Oh, no, you have yeah. to say it again. You have to say it again yeah. before we lose you. Yeah, that there's there's so much going on in the darkness in my paintings. Right, the power of that light emerging from the dark is only really done well because there is information in the dark, and that you mentioned. No. Nope. Of course, we lost right before you got to the the uh, fun part. I can see some of these. Well, there's that transparent oxide red. It's such a wonderful color. It is our number one selling color in North America. Even it's probably because I'm buying it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I am more than titanium white. Yeah. <laughs> I buy it by the bucket loads. <laughs> the, Dutch, the Dutch are always, you know, confused. It's like, what? You know, how is this the most? And we finally got them to make it in a large tube. So now we have the 150 mil available uh, in the transparent oxide red. So for studio painters like yourself who we'll go through it a lot, you'll have to check that out. Again, I really enjoy the perspective here too, Tina. I know we lost you for a second, so I'm going to. I'm going to wax on, uh, but uh, yeah, I love the perspective and this line across the figure in the foreground, background, really wonderful. Yeah, it's a big part of my teaching that I do to help artists understand how to create that sense of depth within the painting, in a, mm -hmm. in a whether it's dark or light, but especially in the darks, and how to understand that there are yellows in the dark that transparent oxide yellow yes. is critical for that because oh, we lost you again right after because it is well just the way it captures and reflects light yes yeah yeah and i have a trick question for students i i asked them about if we had a, a bowl of lemons here and we turned out the lights uh, and it was pitch black in here, what color would the lemons be? And and some people still say yellow. 
And I say, so would they still be yellow if we had a candle lit? Would they be yellow if we were at the bottom of the ocean? You know, uh, they begin to understand. Yeah, that, that color is in a constant state of flux. Color is light. Light is color. Always changing. And then what's next to it, too. Uh, right. And what's next to it. Yes. Yeah. True. That's a jo Joseph Albers, wonderful teachings. Every begin beginning color theory person needs to take a look at that if you haven't. Now, I want to know, is the champagne come out at the beginning of the workshop or at the end? <laughs> Wait for you. <laughs> that oh, no, we lost you again. It is a great picture. Give you a second to get back through here. That's a that's a four thirty in the afternoon thing, Jeff. There you go. There you go. You came back on the answer. That's perfect. Well, it looks like everybody's enjoying themselves. That's fantastic. Yes, this is in Italy at the Florence studio, uh, and it is really one of my, it's probably my second home studio. I love Frank and Laura there, and uh, a lot of good friends teach there, Romel, Jerry Salinas, Michelle Dunaway. Wow, sign me up. That sounds fantastic. Florence is such a magical place. I think the thing that stunned me most about going to Florence for the first time was how close together all these monuments from the history of Western art are to each other. You study the Renaissance and it's several pages in your art history book. And many of these paintings and sculptures are literally around the corner from each other. <laughs> oh, it's a treat to be there. Honestly, I would go back. I tell uh, the school that I don't care if zero students sign up, I will be there. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. All right, all right, that is, I'm gonna stop the share here so we can get back and I'm gonna bring us both together there. Oh, we've lost, there we go, we got you yeah. back. I sure am, sorry about the connection problems, guys. I hope that you're patient with us, thank you. They are a great group and they're 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 uh, saying nice things. So maybe what we'll just have to do is have an encore performance at a later date, uh, when, we're, when we're all hired, hardwired in uh, and and we'll have another conversation and look at some different yes, pictures, talk about some other things as well. But uh, I definitely uh, what I missed and maybe we can talk about before we lose you. Oh, we lost you again. Is uh, how you were using those transparent oxides. I think that's a great lesson. Maybe that's what we focus on. We can do a demo or something like that in the future. All right, I am going to try and take a look here, Tina. While you're on hold, there, I'm going to see if we can find some questions that we can answer. There we are. There you are. You're back. You're back. I've got. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. No worries. We're making it through. We've got lots of great questions. I'm going to peruse through here and see. Um, the scale of your paintings, I think, is really impressing a lot of folks. A lot of the artists work we look at, there are some large paintings in there, but they all tend to be in that middle ground. But the ma majority of what you've shown, right, is all large scale. Do you ever work on smaller scale? Did you hear? Did you get that question, Tina? No, I didn't. I get lost you after the middle ground. Um, so the uh, um, do you work on smaller scale or always large? Paintings? Oh yes. Oh no, I've painted full figures in a eight by ten or smaller even. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> I basically just paint whatever I feel the painting needs, the the size or the palette, the the substrate, the brushes, all that's determined on. What We have lots of folks who also are making comments about uh, using the transparent oxides. They are wonderful colors. Um, for the Cobra painters out there, there's some uh, available too. And there are going to be 30 new Cobra colors. So it's going to be closer to what you uh, have with Rembrandt. So keep your eyes and ears open for that. Oh, we lost... Tina, we'll see if she can come back in. Oh, there we go. We lost you all together. Now you're back. Yeah, I saw it flip to Zoom and I just hung my head in sadness. <laughs> no. 
what? How could I have this much trouble? I do Zoom all the time. I don't know what the world's happening. I don't know what's going. On. It is can be so random, you know. It is so random, and and we can only control so much, right? So we're going to do our best, and I, I think uh, you're doing great. You're doing great. Um, let's see. Mostly, it's just people are blown away. They love the work. They love hearing you talk about it. Um, it says, oh, it says there, there's, it's always interesting that Western art is recognizable, but is there an Eastern style of art? Yes, there is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an expert on. Oh, no. We're definitely going to have to have a uh, encore performance because we're missing out on some gems, I'm sure, here. Yeah, I don't know. You know, a lot of the times I think Western art is categorized just by subject matter. Um, you know, of course, we've got the Western landscape. We've got, you know, the mythology of the West. Um, but I think it's more than that, don't you think? I know we missed everything you said. So I'm <laughs> just that I, here. Yeah, just that I'm not an expert on the genres that there are, but the world is a wide place. So I think if you can imagine it, there is one for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I tend to see the East Coast as being tied more to tradition uh, than the West. And I think that's true of just life in general. Uh, um, the West has always kind of been seen as a, as a place where you reinvent and rediscover yourself in the context of the landscape, particularly. But, uh, uh, you know, everything from the, the Hudson River School to uh, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe and, and New Mexico and to modern painters, but the, this mm -hmm. idea of escaping into the West. First, what do you you were mentioning? When who is the first artist who was a Western artist that you said, "Oh, I like that. I want to paint Western art." Oh, I definitely think that would have been Wyeth, for sure. Wyeth, for yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, my I remember seeing some um, Rembrandt sculptures uh, when I was pretty young, and thinking they were amazing. And I've always fantasized about sculpting at some point, but I don't know that I ever will. I'm. Um, so in love with oil painting and I don't, I would never want to do anything that would make me forget what I already know in this space. And I don't trust my brain to say I can go study something completely outside of that and then come back to it and do anything with it. But I see people like um, John Coleman and I'm like, well, he's doing incredible in everything he does. So, yeah. 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 No, there, there, I think for me, it was probably Charlie Russell was Ooh. the first. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, being in Montana, growing up in, in the Northwest like that, he was omnipresent <clears throat> as a painter. Whether you were into fine art or not, everybody kind of accepted that Charlie Russell was a cowboy artist. And and, uh, and I always liked him compared to Remington. Remington was tighter and, and uh, you know, the, you know, genius painter as well. But there was something more expressive about Russell's mark making and the fact that uh, he captured uh, some elements of that lifestyle that Remington, you know, glorified and mythologized. But Russell was more like, this is what it's like to sit out in the snow <laughs> on the Montana prairie and, and uh, watch cows. So it was a total different experience. Yeah. So, so much of my early influence in art at all were illustrators because mm -hmm. I was, uh, I imagined myself from the beginning as an illustrator, I didn't know that the world of fine art really even existed until 2012 when I first my, took my first workshop and started to try to learn how to paint. And before that, I was just really heavily, heavily influenced by all of the, the famous illustrators of the 30s and 40s. Yeah. Like Loomis and, you know, yeah. Um, Rockwell, all these. Yeah, that, that's where I mainly saw and the kind of work that I was even exposed to was just in books. I wasn't even, hadn't even seen any real art museums until much later in life. Yeah. Well, I think for me too, book illustrations, um, for sure, were the early influence. I mentioned going to the Western art shows when I was a kid. There wasn't really, it's Spokane, Washington. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the town. It's in the eastern part of the state. It, it's a uh, has really more in common with Idaho and Montana and the Midwest than it does with the Pacific coast. Um, but uh, not a lot of opportunities to see art. 
uh, there, but uh, I had a wonderful teacher in high school and, and lots of encouragement from parents. Um, but yeah, the, the experiences I've seen are really limited to reproduction for the Yeah, most part. I think my like first real museum trip was my senior year in high school. I got to go to Chicago's museum. And before oh, then, fantastic. Had... pardon? A fantastic museum, the Art Institute. Oh, it is. It really is. Um, one of my favorite. Of course, I also love the Clark. I, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to the Clark Museum. They've got great sergeants there uh, and Boldini. And I mean, there's just some and they have some great Western art there, too. So there's it's a, it's a great space. But uh, yeah, my I'm broadening that all the time. In fact, I consider that just as important as that continuing education piece we talked about before. Oh, absolutely. You know? I agree 100%. I'm constantly adding to my knowledge of masters I didn't even know existed yeah. and what I can consider a master versus what may be considered a master by establishment, you know, yeah. people. Yeah. I think looking at art, visiting museums, galleries, uh, I, th I think I'm inspired by that as much as anything else. And, and it's a learning opportunity too. You see things that, uh, you get excited about, you you know, for me, and I'm sure it's the same for you as a painter, you're up close, you get your nose in it, trying to see what they're doing and how they did it and, and what choices they made. And, and uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's always a great opportunity. Um, That's one of the things I art. love about unfinished painting, because you can find out what that painter was thinking if you can examine an unfinished masterwork. And yeah. I got to hold an unfinished bougro in my hands when I got to go to the Art Renewal Center's collection to see my own work and they have like work by, I mean, they own almost every bougro that's not in a museum. Uh, and I, I held this painting in my hand and I thought to myself, they don't need it. I could probably leave here with this and they wouldn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, what the hell are you thinking? You can't take this painting. I'm just going to slide this into my yeah. But there was such an education in that little tiny study. It had like an ear and a part of a hand and piece like a piece of a cheek. And then the actual 17 foot like real painting was right there in front of me where he you could see where he was thinking when he started and then where he'd gone to in the finished work. And it was extraordinary. There's so many lessons in that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was. I can't remember when it was, but the Met years ago had an exhibition that was geared towards unfinished paintings. Uh, and so they had everything from the Middle Ages and to the Renaissance examples of works that they had in their collection that were unfinished. And it really was uh, a wonderful opportunity to see that process. Right. Yes. And, and very different. And it evolved over time. You know, the all the prima was not a technique in the 1500s. <laughs> it was a much more thought out lengthy process. And you could see the grisales and, and the buildup of, of the colors and the glazing techniques. And it's fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. It's actually part of the reason why I model my, um, my six month mentorship program the way that I do. So I bring painters in with me into the actual process of me creating my master works so they can see them before anything's on the canvas and, and look at the material I'm using to decide what I'm going to do, how I'm composing. They can see the beginning and as I change the paintings all the way through to the finish of the work. And we do that while I discuss it. So um, I'm pre-recording as I'm painting and then I'm just running back through um, and, and talking them through it while they can ask me questions. And it's, I think, one of the most informative ways to really bring someone in on where what you think you should do in a work and kind of be honest and sort of vulnerable with the realities of a painting process as a professional instead of just sort of the the flashy demo i'm painting the same you know model i always paint and it's going to always come out gorgeous and like a trick a pony show you know yeah, um, yeah. well speaking of workshops um i think this would be a great time as we're getting to the end to talk about what you have on your calendar what's coming up I don't have to leave town again until April uh, 18th. I go down to teach at uh, the Booth Western Art Museum. I'm teaching a Secrets to Painting Children workshop there. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. It's my first time teaching at the museum, but they they like me so much. They've already asked me back for 2025, which I thought was really nice. Really? And uh, yeah, then I'm in uh, Charleston, South Carolina in May and Richmond, Virginia in uh, June. And then I'm overseas in Italy and most likely Portugal as well in uh, September. And then my big, big trip is uh, South Africa in the following October of 2025. I'll do my That's first. Wonderful. I am both excited and nervous about that. It's uh, It seems like an awfully 
far away. <laughs> I'm going to try to break my flight up by stopping in France for a couple of days ahead of time. Yeah, yeah, get acclimated a little bit. Well, Michelle was just got back from there this year, and she had nothing but great things to say. Yeah. She's the one who's making me do it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's the one who called i trust me tina it's going to change your life you have to do it and i said oh i don't know if i have to do that she's yeah you have to do that and i was like oh god i'm trying to do this so here's uh, the question that uh, people are asking and uh that is so are there spots open and where do i find out how to sign up yeah yeah there are um i think there's five spaces left in my composition workshop that happens here in kansas city in april and I keep those pretty small. That's max 10 students. Um, that's a five-day workshop. And that's the most comprehensive workshop I offer on how to compose. We'll work from, from both life and photos. Uh, one male uh, model, one female model. Um, and we'll both take photography and edit and, um, you know, the whole spiel. So there's a lot of information in that one. Um I think we're getting close to full in Atlanta. You'd have to go to their website for that, the Booth Western Art Museum website for that. But everything's linked through tinagarrett.com. Everything. That, so if you go to tinagarrett.com and enter the website, you'll you'll see all of that. And if you want to learn about my mentorship options, that's just uh, tinagarrett.com forward slash mentorship. You know what I will do is I will grab the... Uh web address and put it in the comments i think i can do that that's so nice thanks jeff i'm going to give it a shot here anyways <laughs> ta-da there it is you guys there is the web address to to visit tina's website and you'll see all about her some wonderful work obviously but also information about upcoming events and workshops so check that out and sign up today <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any uh, other announcements, events you want to mention while while we're here? Oh, gosh, I don't think I can think of anything other than how proud I am to be part of the Rembrandt family. Um, I have long time been sponsored with Rosemary Brushes, and I love that I can put two of the most important pieces of what I do for what I create for what I need to do as an artist and I can put them together and uh, I'll be going to the Portrait Society. I'm faculty there and at the um, Oil Painters of America uh, National, and I'll be able to um, rem you know, represent you guys and represent the things that I really do love and need in my work. And it just makes me feel really proud to do it, Jeff, really. Thank you. Well, thank you. We're, like I said, honored to have you and appreciate everything that you do uh, for sure and everything that all of our ambassadors do to contribute to uh, the education about materials and studio practice. That's really what it's about, when, you know, sharing what it is we do and what makes things work and and uh, kind of demystifying the process in a way for everybody so that everybody can have their own success and enjoy the process, right? So true. Richard said that when he accepted his uh, Lifetime Achievement Award of Teaching at the Portrait Society that we don't own this information and we have a responsibility to pay it forward if we love great art and want there to be great art. 200 years from now. You have to share it and you know it. And so when you find someone who's taught that by their teacher they're going to teach that to you and encourage you to expand into sharing what you know sometime later and it's 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 such a great community to be a part of it is what a great role model he has been for so many people and, and great words uh it, it really is i think it's an important extension of our identity as artists uh, that uh, that we're constantly sharing something that's been part of the role i think for a long time uh, when you embrace it, embrace it, it really can be life changing. Oh my gosh, lots of final thank yous and goodbyes. And I appreciate everybody, especially Tina, for being here. Thank you so much. And thank you all of you for joining us. Our second uh, event on YouTube. And it looks like we made it uh, all the way through to the end. Of course, some folks are saying, now wait a minute, we're supposed to be giving away some paint. Don't take off too soon. Uh, well, my little uh, name chooser rolled out two names. Uh, so we're going to give away two sets, you guys. So it's uh, going to go to, drumroll please, Sunita Mather, if I'm pronouncing that right, S-U-N-I-T-A, Mather, M-A-T-H-U-R. Sunita, you are one of the winners. And our other winner is Cindy Beaumont, Cindy Beaumont. So congratulations, you guys. Uh, the way to get a hold of me is on Facebook. Uh, we're Royal Talents NA. Actually, let me type that in there too. Uh, I'll give you the hashtag and you can direct message me and then we'll get you set up 
uh, with your goodies. And you can try out some of the uh, Rembrandt paint for yourself. Uh, so congratulations again, Sunita and Cindy. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And we will see you next time on Creator Studio Live. See you later, everybody.